My goal was to record a solo album at the Cabin by the Lake. Certainly not the first musician to do this. Google Cabin Fever and see for yourself. The cabin was built by my great-grandfather. It has remained in the family ever since. Naturally, it's been spruced up over the years. It now has running water, a high-powered generator for electricity, plus an indoor toilet. A recent addition after a bat got tangled in my ex-wife's hair while she was having a tinkle. Which leads me to why I came out here in the first place. In the middle of Nowheresville, Ontario, in the cold of early spring. My marriage ended two weeks before Christmas. My wife dumped me, and she made off with her younger and more handsome co-worker, Carl. I hate Carl, but I digress. Needless to say, I was at a crossroads. Thus, I started writing songs. Once I scratched out the first couple songs, the floodgates opened and the rest followed accordingly. By the end of January, I had composed enough songs for a solo acoustic album. I promised myself I wouldn't call the album Cabin Fever. I brought two acoustic guitars, my Gibson J100 and a vintage Harmony circa 1960, which I used for open tuning and slide guitar. I also brought some hand drums and shakers, a plethora of high quality microphones and my laptop, plus a bottle of single malt scotch and plenty of grub. It's a three and a half hour drive straight north cabin so far off the beaten path that not even Google knows of its existence. I've done this drive more times than I can count, and it's never easy. I got lost on my way up, and not for the first time. Eventually, after doubling back, I found the correct side road, and made it just before sunset. Not a good way to start. And things were about to get worse. The cabin was eerily quiet. Darkness was impending. So I quickly got to work. First, I lit the kerosene lanterns, then I started the generator and checked to see if the toilet was working. It was. There was enough chopped wood and kindling to last all week if needed. I fired up the wood stove, the cabin warmed up wonderfully, then I unloaded my gear and put the food away. Finally I could relax. I sighed as my buttocks hit the familiar feel of the old leather couch, a lifetime of memories surrounding me. Mom's rocking chair cradled in the corner, Dad's Remington hanging dutifully on the adjacent wall next to the mounted antlers. The collection of family photos on the mantel place, including a picture of me with my beloved grandmother, taken at this very cabin, and a wedding photo of my ex-wife in her stunning gown, somewhere off the coast of San Lucia. I rested my feet on the coffee table and sipped my drink, trying not to tear up. Unfortunately, my mind scurried down the wrong rabbit hole and I was lured into a deep depression. My life was in shambles. This was rock bottom. Filled with grief, I found solace in the bottle. Until sleep took me under its spell. Day one. I woke to strange noises. What the heck is that? I rubbed my eyes. 
My mouth was as dry as a musician's sense of humor. My head hurt. I needed water and Tylenol pronto. I'm too old for this. I reminded myself. No more booze, I promised. I had an album to record. I made a hearty breakfast of bacon and eggs and strong coffee. I ate ravenously. All the while, the scraping noises continued. Coming from the lake. This cabin was built on a peninsula. It's completely surrounded by water and tall trees. This type of solitude can induce claustrophobia and or agoraphobia in certain individuals. This cabin certainly has a dark history in that regard. My grandmother committed suicide back here in the 80s. It's tragic. She, too, was a musician. I should check that out. I grumbled while groping my coffee mug. Better grab the gun on the way out, just in case. As always, the view was stunning. Soft morning sun sparkled over tops of trees, which provided plenty of shade in the afternoon. The deck is cozy with enough room to sit and read a paperback while enjoying the generous backdrop. Beyond the deck lurks McNamee Lake. With squinted eyes, I scan the ashen lake. Aside from the blustering breeze, sweeping up pieces of icy snow and the gaggle of Canadian geese bobbing about their business, the lake was deserted. The sound sent chills up my spine, as if warning me not to stick around for the week. When I retreated to the safety of the cabin, the sound followed after me. Then it hit me. The lake ice was rubbing against itself. It's thawing. This is normal. Lakes do that this time of year. It should be obvious. I shrugged my paranoia off as jitters. I was in solitude with no internet, surrounded by a lake making strange noises. I'll get over it. Time to get to work. Having set up shop in the living room, I placed a microphone in close proximity to my guitar. Three more in various spots around the cabin, including one strategically placed on the ceiling hoping to capture the full spectrum of sound. I placed the vocal mic in front of me and tuned the guitars, ready to roll. With the instruments and recording equipment in check, I went about setting up the cameras. My iPhone provided a close-up of my guitar work while my GoPro captured the full performance as well as the ambiance of the rustic cottage. Slow going at first, my fingers were clumsy, my voice lacking confidence. Couldn't find my groove. It's not every day one finds themselves alone in a hundred-year-old log cabin, encapsulated by a creaky lake. My voice and my fingers needed time to warm up. By the third cup of coffee, things started to improve. It was tiresome, but by the end of the day, I managed to record three songs. Hard Luck and Trouble, Country Livin', Whiskey Drinkin', and a spiteful little number called So Long to Know You. Nightfall came. 
After enjoying steak dinner and some scotch, I retired to the couch. So far, so good. Day two. I awoke with a terrible sweat, shaking. Nightmares dissolved in my mind like ice cubes slipping into a cool drink on a warm day. I forced myself out of bed, urinated, and went straight for the coffee maker. Coffee in hand, I meandered to the deck, ready to relax and have a cup. And before I could settle into the lawn chair, however, something weird happened. A brisk breeze brushed the back of my neck, sending a searing shot coursing through my body and spilling my coffee in the process. What the? Something whizzed past me. I wasn't alone. I went for my gun and didn't dawdle. And I searched the premises, gun in hand, looking for any intruders. It's a small plot of land. It didn't take long. The snow on the ground had recently melted, and in its place came a mixture of cranky mud and slippery slosh. Chomping along the cold, sodden soil made me miserable. My feet were soaked. And then I noticed the track marks. The tracks were unlike any I'd seen. Long, curvy claws, the tip cut deep and wide, bear-like. Twice as large, spaced further apart, judging from the depth of them. The thing was gargantuan. I scratched my head. Something about the track marks seemed wrong. I returned to the cabin, fetched my phone. I wanted to document them. So when I'm back in Wi-Fi, I could search them up. Problem was, when I returned, the tracks were gone. I was bewildered. This was a different version of outside. Moments ago, the morning was full of birdsong, not anymore. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief. I gotta get out of here. I said, not trusting the sound of my own voice. Don't be ridiculous, I answered. I just got here. I was right. I marched back inside the cabin, put the gun back in its rightful spot on the wall. I poured myself a fresh cup and drank my coffee in quiet desperation. Something wasn't right. The air in the cabin was too thick, the silence was deafening. I nearly forgot my true purpose for coming here. My eyes glanced at the old Winchester next to the antlers and remained there for an uncomfortable length of time. Too weary to eat, I unlatched my acoustic guitar case and pulled out my Gibson, placing it neatly on the stand. When I opened the other case, it was empty. I panicked. That old Harmony was irreplaceable. I ran outside, gun in hand, murder in mind, but of course, nothing was out there. I fled to the cabin, ready to give up and go home, and to my surprise, my old Harmony was sitting on the stand next to the Gibson, gleaming. Impossible. Had it always been there? With shaky hands, I strummed a chord. It was in tune. Reluctantly, I fired up the laptop and went to work. The first song I recorded was a Delta Blues number called Hammer Song, both a tribute to Hammertown, Ontario, as well as a nod to American folk legend John Henry. The song came out swimmingly. I tried my hand at it again, but nothing beat that first take. The blues licks were ferocious, the vocals drenched in gut-wrenching soul. I was pleased. So much so that I had awoken my appetite. I plundered through some bacon and eggs, then I made a rough mix of the song. It needed something special, so I added some shakers and a jambe for support. That's when I noticed the applause. At first I thought it was percussion, but upon further review it was more than that. Underneath my voice and guitar was an actual audience. For real. 
They were clapping along, cheering sporadically, even catcalling from time to time. I pulled up the files from my laptop, looking for visual clues as to where the sound was coming from, but found none. Instead, my laptop slammed shut. I leapt out of the chair, screaming in surprise. Who's in here? I shouted. Show yourself. Someone was in the cabin. It was undeniable at this point. Do you want me to leave? I regretted asking this. Truth be told, I wanted to stay. I had work to do, not to mention my grand finale. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, and I grabbed the Gibson and strummed an open G chord. It sounded like an ocean. I restarted my computer, pressed record, then began picking through a tune called Sorry Again. A sappy, fingerstyle song I wrote shortly after my marriage ended. Again, I nailed it on the first take. As I finished the final chord, I was surprised to see the glow of the setting sun peeking through the adjacent window. I checked the time. 7.51 p.m. That's not right, I told myself, but it was. Apparently time was not on my side. The day was spent in hours, but the music was effortless. After blending the guitar with the vocals, I pressed play and was immediately awestruck. My voice was divine, my guitar an orchestra. That said, I didn't know what to make of the voices. With the volume turned up on the headphones, you could hear them chattering amongst themselves at the quiet parts, singing along to their favorite parts. Judging from the recording, you'd think I was performing to a live audience. <laughs> At least they're applauding, I said in a wobbly voice. I'd hate to see what would happen if they were displeased. By now, it was pushing 11 p.m., as ludicrous as that was. I made some canned ravioli and washed it down with a single malt scotch. Just a little, I reminded myself. No more hangovers. I added another log to the fire, and then I slipped into a deep and troublesome sleep. Day 3 Something startled me awake, a noise coming from outside. I've been having a nightmare. In it, I was being chased through the woods by a grisly monster. Bizarrely, the monster was singing. But I didn't recognize the song, nor did I understand the words. Those sinister-sounding syllables, however, stayed with me as I stooped over the couch, scared shitless. After emptying my bladder, I grabbed the gun and grumbled outside. The air was basement damp and chilled me to the bone. A copse of soggy black spruces bordered the semi-frozen lake the leaves ridding themselves of last night's rainfall. To my horror, those inhuman claw marks emerged from the lake, making great strides leading to the back of the cabin. I cocked the gun and sprinted around the deck, fully expecting a confrontation. The deck was empty. Save for a paperback resting on a crooked lawn chair with coffee stains dripping down the side. The lake cranked out a creepy sound, startling me. Then something nuzzled the nape of my neck. I gotta get out of here. I snapped. I rushed inside and began the daunting task of packing up. Yet... As I was putting my guitars away, something prevented me from doing so. I couldn't bring myself to leave. Instead, I re-listened to the work I'd done on day one. The songs were extraordinary. That said, the auspicious audience was impossible to ignore. I was suddenly furious. Someone or something was hijacking the mixes. My mind jumped to many conclusions, each scarier than the last. Ultimately, I shrugged it off. What choice did I have? I 
tuned up the old harmony and cut the sixth song, a blues number using Dad Gad tuning called Fell in Mud. This was my most difficult song to play. Originally, my plan was to record the guitar first, then overdub the vocals afterwards, but I decided against it. Instead, I recorded it in one take. Unbelievable. I was stunned by my own performance. My voice was gnarly, full of emotion. My finger-picking precise and with purpose. And the audience filled in the quiet bits. The idea that I wasn't alone was indeed freaking me out, but the results spoke for themselves. And so with butterflies swirling in the pit of my stomach, I reached for my Gibson, flat pick in hand, looking to keep the momentum going. I tuned up, then pressed record. I strummed a G7 sus chord, letting it sustain, then I leaned the opening riff of the devil I know, someone spoke my name. I jumped from my seat. My blood went cold. I hate being interrupted. Who's there? I spat. My voice fell to the floor with a thud. I knew it wasn't there, but... The allure of my tobacco burst Gibson guitar was irresistible. I sat back down, took a deep breath, hit record. Sure enough, just as I started the riff, a voice spoke inside my headphones. This time I kept playing. Although my hands were shaky, I managed to complete the song. It wasn't perfect, so I did another take. Then another. With each take, I was bombarded with bellows and hollers from the omnipresent audience. After nine tries, I finally got it. Wearily, I mixed the vocals with the blended guitars until I produced a pleasing sound. Upon playback, those spectators were as pesky as ever. I'll have to fix that when I get home, I said, stone cold terrified. Having eaten dinner and tidied up, I loaded some wood into the stove before collapsing into the couch. I was spent. Darkness engulfed me. The walls were closing in, the air was difficult to breathe, panic turned to despair. Would anyone notice if I disappeared? Would anyone care? No. I was insignificant. The world would go on without me, as if I'd never existed. The wretchedness of my personal life came flooding back. All the while, my eyes fixated on the shotgun on the wall. You came here to kill yourself, I reminded myself. I nodded. My plan was to go out with a bang. I'll make my final record a masterpiece that the world would remember me by. I'll place the barrel of the shotgun in my mouth and blow my brains to smithereens, Cobain style. You're not going to chicken out, are you? I asked. I shook my head. Good. Stick to the plan. Footsteps startled me. They were approaching at an alarming speed, crunching through the crisp foliage, stomping outside the cabin door. My stomach turned over. I stifled a scream. Carefully, I tiptoed towards the gun and removed it from the rack. Whoever's behind that door better start praying. Who's there? I asked. At first, nothing happened. And then I heard the scream. Then I heard the voice of a woman. Lucas. She whispered from all around me. I stumbled backwards as if drunk. I regained my composure and pointed the gun at the door. Identify yourself, or I'll blow you straight to hell. I gripped the gun with cold certainty I was going to kill something. 
voice whispered again, this time more forcefully. Lucas. I know my own name. Something crashed outside the door, and that was all it took. Bang! Shotgun blast took a huge chunk of the door with it. Peeked outside, nobody was there. Nor were there any track marks, just mud and trees and lake. The moon was precarious. A lone wolf cried out, shattering the silence. The loneliness of the howling wolf made me weep. I must be losing it, I said, wiping the stream of fresh tears from my face. <sighs> I shook my head. It's not true. I had already lost it. It's what brought me out here in the first place. I regarded my decimated door with utter disdain and shivered. The bitter breeze wafting into the cabin was unwelcoming. And without a second thought, I fetched some tarpaulin and duct tape from the shed and went to work patching the door. It took the better part of an hour, but I did the trick. Fatigue held me in its tiresome grip. Meanwhile, my ears continued their incessant ringing from the weapon's disorderly discharge. I sprawled out on the couch, and for the first time since arriving, I slept soundly. Day 4 I woke up well rested, ready to roll. A speckle of pale light sprinkled in the cabin, as did a newfound sense of purpose. Nothing was going to stop me from completing this album. If I really push myself, I told myself while loading the coffee maker, I could finish the album today. This was true, but I'd have to go hard. I could mix the rest of the songs at home. I opened my laptop, ready to get started, and was surprised by a crimson face flashing across the screen. His primordial eyes sunk deep into its cheekbones, toothy snarl made me cringe. The laptop gurgled and then went blank. Suddenly I was frozen with fear, my eyes darting towards the shotgun. You haven't lost the nerve. Have you? I asked myself in a chilling voice. I shook my head and forced my attention away from the gun and instead warmed my hands over the wood stove. My guitar case opened itself. Apparently I should get back to work. The feeling that I was under a spell was irrefutable. I strummed an E chord. The sound filled the cabin with rich overtones. As though in a dream, I leaned into the next song. Eyes on You, a weepy ballad about how I met my ex-wife. Halfway through the tune, I felt something tugging forcefully at my leg. I sprung from my chair in surprise, ruining the take. I swore under my breath and I started up again. Although the entire performance was fraught with stabs and jabs from the invisible bystander, with an endless choir singing along with each chorus, I crushed it. Without a second thought, I placed my capo on the seventh fret and found my thumb pick. Then I ran through a fingerstyle blues with a gospel twist called After the Rain, who proved to be another first taker. I was on a roll. The afternoon flew by like a midsummer's dream. And as the evening sun descended across the marmalade sky and the cascade of stars illuminated the world above me, I finished my album. Soon afterwards, I slept and was feasted upon by an endless cycle of nightmares. Day 5 Morning Light Day 5 Morning filled the cabin with light. 
As the memories of dreamlike monsters faded, I forced myself off the couch. The laptop came alive. That devilish face was speaking in tongues directly into my head, flashing on and off the screen full of furious rage. I jumped so high that I cracked my head on the ceiling, biting my tongue in the process. In a frenzy, I slammed the laptop shut and started packing up. I spent the remainder of the day building a new cabin door. The shed had the appropriate tools, and lumber was not in short supply. It was a daunting task, but I didn't mind. It kept my mind off the spirits prowling about. Before leaving, I snapped a pic of the cabin with my guitars leaning against it. My beat to death harmony rested at the foot of the newly built log door. My Gibson next to it bursting with brilliance. A beam of radiant light spilled onto the guitars, giving them an angelic appearance. This would prove to be the album cover. I made it home by nine. With me came a new resolution. A reason to stick around a wee bit longer. I wanted to show off my new songs. I sent my recordings to the record company who were over the moon. They thought the audience was a clever touch. I emailed the album art telling them to edit it to their liking and then using the footage from my iPhone and GoPro, I made a video for Hammer Song. I gave the video a grainy tinge for ambiance, blending close-up guitar bits with the full cabin experience. The dancing orbs in the background were barely noticeable. As I was uploading the video onto YouTube, an email arrived. It was from the record company. Great stuff, Lucas. Here's the finished album cover. Hope you like it. We certainly do. Big things ahead. When I saw the album cover, I nearly died. They had cropped the pick and boosted the color, making the details much more intense. What first caught my attention was the name of the album, printed in simple lettering just below my name. Cabin Fever. Hmm. Before I could wrap my mind around this anomaly, something else caught my eye. There was a face peering out from the crook of the window. Transparent as though photoshopped. The face was eerily familiar. I zoomed in and gasped. This makes no sense, I muttered under my breath. But then again, it made perfect sense. It was my grandmother. Alright, so this story was uh, written by a fantastic um, author named Marcus Starr. Uh, you can find more of their work on Reddit under their profile, Call Me Star, with two R's. Uh, you can also find their uh, book on Amazon. There's a recent book out by them titled Nora's Curse. I actually had the pleasure of reading this uh, before it was released, and uh, it's definitely worth a read. It's a really interesting book. Um, really cool characters, very funny, it's, you know, it's got scary moments, um, and just unlike anything I've ever read before, um, there's actually, like, songs in between certain chapters, and it's from the perspective of a writer, uh, of, of a, a songwriter similar to this story, so, uh, if you enjoyed this particular short story, uh, and you want to read more, more things like this, please check out, uh, Call Me Star in the description down below. And check out their novel on Amazon, which I'll also link in the description down below. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, please like, subscribe, and check out the next video, which I'll uh, link in the top right corner here. Have a great night. The drive to Algonquin Park lasts longer than expected. 
after running into traffic and making a few wrong turns along the way, we got there late in the afternoon. My dad paid the fees at the front gate and proceeded to drive the remaining kilometers into the park. We eventually found our way to the canoe launch and got out of the van, stretching our legs. My dad and uncle, Steve, were looking over the maps, which appeared to have been hand-drawn by park rangers and were encased in clear plastic. I watched as they traced the route we would be traveling. They both agreed that it shouldn't be too complicated to make it to the campground, despite the fact that we had been delayed getting there. A little bit late in the day to be starting a portaging trip, said a park ranger to my dad as we were packing up the last of our camping supplies into the canoes. Uh, we're meeting up with some friends who were out there waiting for us. They've already set up camp, so we've just got to make it out to the island. Well, be careful. Once it gets dark in Algonquin, it becomes a whole different world. You folks be safe now. Thanks, we will. My dad had lectured us the whole way in a similar fashion, and I couldn't help but grin to hear him getting a taste of his own medicine. Apparently there were people who got lost in the park every year, never to be seen again. And there were bears and wolves, coyotes, and other animals in the wilderness, and we would be guests in their domain. I climbed into the front of one boat, and my uncle took a seat in the back. My brother was in the other canoe, and my dad climbed in awkwardly, nearly tipping it over in the process. The water was crystal clear and pristine, and I could see minnows swimming in the shallows, frogs and tadpoles. I took a deep breath in, enjoying the crisp, fresh air of the northern outdoors, and admired a great blue heron which was resting in the shade nearby. Paddling along the river, we found our way towards the lake, which opened up before us, revealing our first glimpse of the pristine beauty of the provincial park. The silence was overwhelming, away from car mufflers and computer fans and the constant noise of the city, and the sense of sudden peace was overwhelming. All I could hear was the sound of my paddle slicing through the calm water occasional call of a bird from the surrounding pine forest that engulfed us. Other trees and plant life fly in the lake as well, maples and white birches. Some pale-looking twisted trees sprang up from the high cliffs, growing against all odds, their roots hanging on from rocky outcrops that ranged in rusty reddish colors. My brother Noel and my dad were struggling with their canoe coordination. Noel and I frequently went fishing, using the canoes at our cabin when we went up there, so I knew he wasn't the one having issues. It was my dad. My dad had never operated a canoe before, I realized in that moment. Although he'd spoken confidently, saying he knew what he was doing, he was struggling. He had insisted on sitting in the rear of the canoe, which is the most crucial position in the boat since you act as the rudder and the primary source of power. Noel was fruitlessly paddling away up front while my dad lackadaisically slapped at the water, looking at the scenery, sending the boat veering back and forth in a zigzag pattern. His ineffectual efforts eventually caused Noel to get slightly annoyed, and I heard them bickering back and forth with each other. I looked back at them trailing far behind us and saw their twisting, turning path was taking them all over the lake, whereas we were traveling in more or less a straight line. Has your dad ever paddled a canoe before? Steve asked. I think it's been a while by the looks of it. Oh boy. Maybe he should let Noel steer. Yeah, I'll suggest it at the first stop. We arrived at the first place where we had to portage across a short stretch. For those who aren't familiar, this means you have to carry your canoe across dry land for a little ways to get you to the next river or lake so that you can continue your trip. If you have a cooler and luggage and other items, 
you have to hike back and forth, sometimes two or three times. And this is when it comes in handy to pack light. It took us two trips to bring everything, including the canoes, to the other side. The hike between lakes was about ten minutes, so it wasn't too bad. That was the easy one, according to the map, my Uncle Steve said. The next portage is a lot further. Great, I thought to myself. It'll probably be my job to carry the cooler again, too. We got back in the carved wooden boats and started paddling once more. My uncle had the map and was directing us which way to go. While my brother followed with my dad in the other canoe. At least he had managed to get him to switch seats, though. As we went along, I saw they were now keeping pace with us, with Noel at the rear of the boat generating more power, and his more experienced paddling keeping them on course. What do you guys know about the legends of Algonquin, my uncle asked us, making conversation. He and my dad both had a wealth of knowledge on various topics, but things like this were my uncle's specialty. He was an avid outdoorsman and a skilled fisherman who took a deep interest in aboriginal culture and the stories they told over generations. Uh, nothing, really. Oh, so you've never heard of the Memaguisi? We all stayed silent and waited for him to explain. My uncle was a bit of a jokester as well, so it was hard to tell if he was kidding sometimes. He liked to put on a straight face and tell an elaborate lie in the form of a story just to take you along for the ride. And so we waited to see if he was trying to fool us before answering yes or no. Eh, they're water spirits. Mischievous little buggers. They'll steal your camping supplies if you're not careful. Food, clothes, fishing rods. Whatever they like. Eh, and they can send your canoe off course too. You'll just be paddling along like we are now, and the Memaguisi will send you off the proper course and you'll end up lost. If you don't show them the proper respect, that is. Okay, enough of that, Steve. Quit trying to scare the kids with that crap. We're barely going to make it to the campsite before dark as it is. Turn right up here. The map says it's going to be over this way. We veered our boats over in that direction at my dad's insistence, and I noticed we were in a very shallow section full of reeds and plants, the canoes almost touching the bottom of the lake. Should we go this way? I, I don't think that's what the map is saying. My uncle was looking at the narrow river doubtfully. The area we were headed towards looked like a swamp, and mosquitoes were already beginning to land on me and bite my neck as we got closer. My dad and uncle pondered over the map for a while while my brother and I sat there slapping at the bugs landing on us. Eventually they decided to take the route which led us down to the shallow winding river surrounded by tall reeds. I could tell by the silence of both of them that they were not quite sure if this was correct. The further we got and the more time passed I noticed the sun had begun to set. Pretty soon it was almost dark. The water eventually became so shallow that it nearly dried up. The river had turned into a muddy creek, and we were forced to turn around. Uh-oh, my dad said. We must have gone the wrong way. We'll have to go back to the lake. I think I read the map wrong. My uncle bit his tongue, and we paddled back against the current. The lake was empty and it was completely dark by the time we got back to it. There was no moon that night, nothing to light our way. My dad told me to get a flashlight and cast the beam towards the shore, looking for a reflective sign, a symbol for a portage point. Just keep that flashlight pointed at the shore and tell us if you see a reflective sign anywhere. This next portage should take us to the lake with the campsite, so there shouldn't be too much further to go after we find it. My heartbeat was quickening with anxious fear as our canoes traveled along near the shore in almost total darkness. I swung the flashlight beam around to check for deadheads and rocks in our path, and told my uncle to veer left or right to avoid hitting things that would have tipped us over. We gotta be careful. Don't want to fall into these waters. 
There's another legend that the people of this area used to speak of. My uncle said while he paddled, trying to distract us from the precarious situation we had gotten ourselves into. It's the Meshigamnig. It's a big horned serpent. Lives in lakes. Eats people. Okay, Steve, that's enough. My dad was yelling when my ears cut a sand that I couldn't place. Steady and persistent, coming from just ahead. The canoes were picking up speed. I looked back and saw my dad and uncle weren't paddling, but they weren't paying attention at all. They were just arguing with each other about who had taken the wrong turn. You and your ridiculous legends, you distracting us with all this, this useless garbage. You don't say that. You're going to upset them. You should apologize. I finally managed to find my voice and I yelled back at them. There's a waterfall up ahead. We're paddling towards a waterfall. They chuckled and told me that was ridiculous. There was a waterfall on the map. They began to bicker up again back and forth and I started to get extremely nervous. The canoes were moving faster and faster but nobody was paddling anymore. And I was just a kid so they weren't listening to me. Can't you see what's happening? I yelled at them. Look how fast we're moving. There's a waterfall up ahead. They abruptly stopped arguing now. The sound of rushing water could be heard distinctly from up ahead. Uh, okay. Let's start paddling towards the shore. I, I think we need to start paddling towards the shore right now. My dad was trying to sound calm, but I could hear the panic in his voice. We all began to paddle as hard as we could. In the dim light, I could barely see anything but the silhouette of trees all around us. In the ink-black water of the lake. Shimmering reflections of stars were flowing in the surface of it. Speeding past an increasing rate. We began to make some headway getting closer to the shoreline. And suddenly our efforts became futile. We were being sucked in, drawn inextricably towards the waterfall. I looked ahead and saw it drawing close. The night sky sat surreally above the surface of the turbulent black water, which flowed downwards, disappearing from sight. And then I saw how close it was. I screamed. Watching in horror, I saw us go over the edge, and the world tipped sickeningly upside down as I fell. Becoming weightless was a harrowing experience, as for a moment I floated through the air, my screams echoing out into the night. The wolves howled in response, and I descended, looking down to see jagged rocks waiting for us below. Far, far, far down below. We fell and our screams echoed across the lake. I tried to point my feet downwards, afraid of what might happen if I impact the water incorrectly. After what felt like forever, I landed in the frigid depths below. And the surface of it hit me with so much force that it nearly knocked the wind out of me and I struggled to breathe as I gasped from the cold, sinking downwards. The weight of my boots dragged me below and I kicked, trying to get them off my feet. It felt like cinder blocks as my head dipped beneath the surface of the water and I gulped it in and it went up my nose, stinging my sinuses. I called out for help and my pleas were drowned by the water once more. My head went under and this time I stayed down longer. Struggling to get back to the surface, I looked around in the murky water and saw a pair of eyes glaring at me from the depths. Yellow eyes that were unblinking and massive and glowing in the darkness. A tipped over canoe was close by when I got to the surface and grabbed hold of it, took a gasping breath of air. My dad and brother were okay, I saw. My uncle had survived the fall too, although his head sustained a larger gash and he appeared dazed and hurt. You need to apologize, Dave, my uncle told my father, sounding drunk now. His words slurred and difficult to understand. You've disrespected the spirits here. Apologize before they kill us all. What? Those stupid stories you were telling to scare the kids? Are you still talking about that shit? Suddenly I felt something wrap around my ankle, and although I held onto the canoe as firmly as I could, I felt myself being dragged down. 
There was no time to scream, but I tried to take a deep breath of air before being pulled down below. My uncle's hand reached down and managed to grab mine. He held on to me for dear life. I felt like I would be pulled into two as the thing from the depths tore up my leg, yanking me downwards. As the time passed beneath the water, my need to breathe became more urgent. I began to thrash and kick my legs, trying desperately to free myself from the thing which was pulling me down. My heartbeat was loud and fast in my ears, and I looked in terror to see the yellow eyes of the thing were very close now. It was coming towards me, and in their murky black water, I could just barely make out its massive horned head and gaping maw. Huge fangs and a split tongue could be seen in the dim light as the massive snake came face to face with me. The enormous beast was so large it could swallow me whole, I realized, and I cringed and waited for that to happen. Momentarily resigned to my fate. But then a light shone down from the surface. A bright torch lamp made the snake cringe and recoil in fear. It loosened its grip on my leg and I felt my uncle pull me up towards the surface. My vision was clouding red and black as I began to feel like I was passing out and I broke out through the surface of the water and was pulled up into a large canoe. Our friends, who had been at the camping site waiting for our arrival, had heard us screaming as we went over the waterfall. The campsite was close by, and we had bypassed our portage point by falling off the waterfall. They had quickly gotten into their boat to come rescue us once they realized what had happened. If not for them, we would have been dead. At least so it seemed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. My dad was repeating these words over and over. It's not your fault, Dave. These things happen. Randy was saying as we paddled over towards the campsite. At least nobody got hurt, right? That's the important thing. My uncle rubbed his bleeding forehead and rolled his eyes at me. Oh, thanks, Uncle Steve, I said to him quietly. He nodded and said, No problem, kiddo. I saw the horned serpent down there, Uncle Steve. I think you're right. I, I think we need to be respectful of the creatures around here. I don't want to get on that guy's bad side again. He smiled, his eyes shining red for just a second in the moonlight. I noticed his face appeared different, like someone else entirely. A being which had been sent to help us, both ancient and wise. Just wait until I tell you the tale of the Great Rabbit. I've got plenty of stories, and each with a lesson. For those who will listen, and who have ears to hear. He put two fingers up over his head, making little bunny ears, and smiled. You ready, Bruce? My producer asks. I'm not ready. Not after last week's fiasco. How could I be? I check my mirror for any faults in my makeup. Suck in my gut. Then walk out on stage to a live studio audience. Enter music. The announcer introduces me. I glance down at my monitor and cringe. The producers make me out to be that sleazy game show host from the days of old. Polyester and all. The camera cuts to me and we're live. All right, folks, I'm happy to be here. Uh, hope you are too. I say, doing my best Bob Barker impression. Let's bring out this week's contestant, shall we? Uh, I'm looking at the camera, and, as if asking the folks at home. And then, cue the audience. 
Let's make a deal with the devil. A contestant takes to the podium. He's a paunchy, middle-aged man, casually dressed with broad shoulders and a generous chin. The camera follows him to the podium. And meanwhile, the audience is going berserk. Cue to me. Ha, knock it off, I tell the audience playfully, and they hush. Peter McNamara, tell us a little bit about yourself, why don't you? Cue to Peter, who's wiping his sweat-soaked forehead. Uh, well, Bruce, back in high school, I was the leading quarterback for the Major D Monarchs. State champs, two years running. These days, I mostly sell insurance. I'm divorced. No kids. Plus, saving the best for last. I'm a lifelong Chargers fan! Crowd cheers. All right, Peter. Are you ready to make a deal with the devil? He was. Great. Let's bring out Damien, shall we? Cue creepy music. Damien appears out of nowhere and is standing next to Peter. Now tell me, Peter, I ask. Do you know the rules? Peter nods nervously, all the while glancing at the extremely tall man who appeared of nowhere and is now standing next to him wearing an outlandish devil suit. Great. So, Peter, tell Damien and the rest of us what is it you most desire. Just remember. Cue the audience. The devil's in the details. Peter's shaking like a leaf. His head looks like a well-polished bowling ball. Uh, well, Bruce, I've given this a lot of thought. Cue to camera three. And what I really want is a big old house on the beach. A big old swimming pool. And a car built like a tank. The crowd agrees. Right away, I see the problem. He didn't stick to the script. And what's this built-like-a-tank nonsense? Where did that come from? Before each show, I sit down with the contestant and tell them how this works. I tell them exactly what to say, when to say it, and more important, what not to say. But the contestants always make a mistake every week. One that ultimately costs them their lives, much to the fervor of the audience. Cue to me. My pearly white teeth are plastered across the screen. Alright then, let's ask the devil if he's willing to make a deal, shall we? Damien Carey is towering over Peter, grinning like a used car salesman. He looms larger than life, both on and off the screen. Audiences love him. He dresses in a skin-tight red leather suit, pointed red tail, pitchfork, and devil horns. But don't let this ridiculous attire fool you, it's all a distraction. Close-up of Damien smiling devilishly into the camera. Uh, well, well, well. What do we have here? Damien asks in his guttural voice. Hmm, Peter, is it? Hmm, I don't know. You ask for so much. But then you must ask yourself, how badly do you really want these things? Are you willing to give up your soul? Peter would. He really, really would. Excellent. Damien sneers into the camera. Just excellent. Camera shows Peter shaking hands with the devil. I took a cautionary step backward, trying my darndest 
not to show fear. I don't want to end up like the previous host. Who would? I cannot let that happen to me, not while everyone is watching. Eh, cut to me. Uh, well, that's fabulous. So, cue audience. Let's make a deal with the devil. Camera zooms in on Peter. Sweating profusely, palms clenched, open mouth smiling, cut to me. That's great, but tell me, Satan, what's the catch? There's always a catch. Oh, the catch is Bruce. He leers into the camera with his don't tell me I didn't warn you look. The car will be big. And it'll drive itself. Peter won't even have to lift a finger. It'll be a smash. Close up of Peter, who appears as happy as a pig in feces. <sighs> I hate the next part. Damien snaps his long and crooked finger, poof. Peter's gone. Vanished. The crowd is gassed. They think this is all TV trickery. As the camera cuts to Damien, who's licking his paws and somehow wagging his tail, I can recall how the previous host died. Can't get that image out of my head. They're still trying to scrape his stains off the floor right where I'm standing, no less. But hey, the ratings speak for themselves. Give the people what they want. Damien is doing his devil shtick, and the audience is applauding him. Millions of viewers are watching, waiting for the inevitable carnage that will soon unfold. Meanwhile, the knots in my stomach are multiplying, my left leg is shaking, I'm stone-cold terrified. Cut to a beach house where a group of partiers appear on the screen, showing off their California tan, sipping exotic drinks from colorful straws while they lounge around a swimming pool in skimpy outfits. Cut to Peter, who's got a drink in each hand and a shit-eating grin stamped across his face. Peter has become the embodiment of the American dream right before our eyes. The audience rages on. I shudder. My stomach fills with butterflies. I know what's coming. If I screw up this next part, my career will be in hell. Camera cuts to me. Uh, so, Peter, tell the audience at home, how does it feel to have your dream home on the beach? Cut to Peter. The girls in the background are whooping and hollering and splashing about. I'll tell you what, Bruce, he says, sipping his drink and enjoying the view. It feels great. What comes next will haunt me at night, when the lights are off and the camera's put away. Some things in life are impossible to forget, and for heartless Hollywood vampire types like myself. Cut to Damien standing next to me, too close for comfort. Well, Peter. His voice, sardonic and cruel. I can see you like the swimming pool. You do like the swimming pool, don't you? The screen shows Peter grinning ear to ear. Good. Well, then. Damien says, licking his moist red lips. Let's cut to the chase. I think it's time to bring out the new car. Damien snaps his keys and a shiny new Hummer appears in the driveway. He's standing next to it, dangling a golden set of keys. I have no idea how he does this or where those cameras are from. I'm not allowed to ask, which is fine by me. Some things are best unknown. Zoom in on Peter who's running, arms out to the driveway, carrying his fruit-filled drinks. The audience oohs and ahs. Wide shot of Damien and Peter standing toe-to-toe -to -toe in front of the Hummer. The Hummer glistens under the warm California sun. Uh, you asked for a big car, am I right? And Damien asks in a bombastic voice. Yes, Damien, I did. 
Well, is this one big enough? Peter nods provingly. Excellent. So what do you say, Peter? I want to take her for a ride? Peter does. Damien snaps his fingers, and suddenly he and Peter are inside the Hummer, seatbelts and all. Peter's drinks are nowhere to be seen. People at home think this is all studio trickery still, but it isn't. Which is one of the reasons why I'm scared to death. I don't know how I ever talk myself into this gig. Cue to dash came inside vehicle. Damien is outwardly pleased. He leans into the camera. Oh, good. Because... Cue the audience. The devil's in the details. They speed off. Peter's head thrusts back as they tear out of the driveway onto the busy beachside boulevard. Damien is smiling, stone-cold murder searing in his eyes. My hatred for this madman is only outmatched by my fear of him. It's a good thing the camera is off me, because I'm looking like I'm about to puke. Cue to the helicopter cam. The audience watches with glee as the murder spree plays out. First, the Hummer guns down a beautiful young woman on rollerblades, blindsiding her. Her body disappears as the perilous vehicle effortlessly runs her over. Blood splashes across its shiny chrome grill, as though biting into a strawberry full of razor blades. The audience is bloodthirsty. They want more. And they'll get it. Cue to the dashboard cam. Peter looks worse than I feel. He's freaking out. Damien's devil may care grin is stretched across his long, reddened face. You're gonna love this next part, Peter. Multi screen with dash cam and heli cam shows the camera veering left onto the sandy beach. One man's head gets crushed like a grape. His brains splatter across his finely chiseled chest. His left eyeball lost in the many crevices of the crimson sand. While his lifeless body flattened on a blood soaked beach towel. Beside him, a figure rests in twisted ruins with tire tracks tattooed across his sun kissed corpse. His arm dangles futilely from its socket like a noose swaying in the breeze. The third victim is caught in the grill of the Hummer. It does a few backflips as the vehicle comes to a halt. Its body falls limply into the warm sand and stays there, bloody, and body parts, and suntan lotion and all. Cut to me, doing my darndest to appear casual. Incredible stuff, Damien, I say, wearing my stapled-on smile. Uh, that was one heck of a bargain you got there, Peter. Does the audience agree with me or what? They do. Good, I hope each and every one of you at home agrees too. Cut to Damien, who's somehow back in the studio. Standing at the podium next to me, twirling his long devil tail, smug as a bug on a rug. His eyes meet mine, I fill with dread. Close up of me, my leg refusing to stay still. Uh, let's see how things are going with Peter, shall we? Wide shot of the beach, the scene is horrific, police everywhere. Trying to regulate the manic crowd who, moments ago, were enjoying a picturesque afternoon at the beach. Camera zooms in on the girl wearing rollerblades, lying face down in a pool of blood. Her neck snapped like a twig, her bleach blonde hair slathered in blood and tiny specks of brain. Multicam shows Peter from every angle as he tumbles out of the Hummer. Cops arrive in droves, have him surrounded. Every bullet in America is pointed at him. He's crying, phlegm and snot flowing from his ruby red nose like honey from a razor's edge. The cops are giving him orders, but he doesn't seem to notice. Instead, he's fumbling for the keys, talking gibberish. His keys slip from his fingers. The audience is biting their nails. Multicamp shows me trying not to vomit. I hold it back as best as I can. The show's almost over, I tell myself. I can make it through this. I must. I'm safe. Until next week, that is. Close up of Peter reaching for his keys. 
It's the last thing he'll ever do. Multicam shows Peter from every angle as a banquet of bullets pulverizes flesh and bone. He flounders like a bloody ragdoll as his brains explode into a million pieces like ravioli hitting a fan. And then he falls flat on his bullet-ridden face. And that's the end of Peter McNamara. The audience rages on. Cue to me. I'm white as a ghost and shaking like a leaf. Oh, it looks like Peter got the wrong end of that bargain. Much applause. Cue music. Zoom in on Damien standing over me, squeezing my shoulder. Staring down at me with a deranged smile stamped across his demonic face. My leg is still twitching, my stomach's in knots. Oh well, folks. I say with as much bravado as I can muster. B be sure to tune in next week and try to have yourself a good night. I look forward to seeing you again next week on... Q. Audience. Let's make a deal with the devil! Tonight's story was written by Scary Tales by Candlelight. You can find their channel on YouTube. Please check the description below. Time for tonight's story. My husband went missing in the mountains weeks ago. He survived. But he's different now. I couldn't explain what I saw that night. Genuinely shocked by what I was witnessing. When Alex initially walked in the front door, I was relieved. I felt like a mountain of stress had been lifted off my shoulders, and I could finally breathe again. Almost three weeks had passed since he and a small camera crew disappeared in the mountains. Out here it's all rocky terrain, pockets of caverns stretching thousands of miles, completely isolated and very much unexplored. They were airdropped almost a month ago. The plan was to meet a week later at the drop location. Alex and the crew never showed up. Authorities sent in search teams, but soon stopped because of the ongoing storms. The operation was deemed too dangerous. So we prepared ourselves for the worst, while still holding out hope. No one thought they would survive, no one ever does. But he did. Isabel? He called out, closing the front door behind him. My body hesitated, feet rooted to the ground, wondering if it was all just a wonderful dream, waiting to fade away at the last moment. But I gave in, running to the front door, to see him standing there. My heart raced as I wrapped my arms around him tightly. I never thought I'd see him again. My mind had already processed all the possibilities of outcome. The likelihood of Alex returning was poor. Yet there he stood. Not a scratch on him. He was just as put together as the day he left, albeit a bit thinner. The moment he stepped forward and walked into the light, I knew something was off. My body tightened. I could feel a sickness growing in the pit of my stomach. 
You become familiar with your partner's habits when you live with them. Their mannerisms, eccentricities. In time, you can read them quite well. They're part of your life. The body can recognize when something isn't right. A gut feeling setting off alarm bells. What did it for me? Were the eyes. That old saying, eyes are the windows into the soul. <sighs> yes. That had never been more accurate. Alex's eyes showed me emptiness, darkness, nothing. It felt like someone was wearing my husband's face. The look he gave me along with that fake smile. I can't stress enough the anxiety that filled me when we locked eyes. I tried to suppress the intrusive thoughts, but it was difficult. Mixing in my mind like oil and water. But I had to celebrate. Alex was back. The family was together again. The kids came running down the stairs when I called out to them and soon we were all huddled together holding Alex as if as if it were the last time. A surreal moment we never thought we'd get to experience. I stepped back and took a deep breath. My eyes met Alex's blank stare and eerie smile, again triggering the same terrible feeling. The discomfort it must have been visible on my face, but he didn't seem to react. He just lowered his head and returned his attention to the kids with eyes still fixed on me. It sent a shiver down my spine. From the moment he walked in, it was clear that he didn't prefer to speak. He avoided most conversations, mainly used gestures to communicate, but with enough coaxing, Alex briefly explained what happened. We were caught in a storm for a few days, he said, seemingly out of breath. Found an abandoned outpost. Not many people. Not much to eat, eat, eat. When he spoke, he kept repeating that word, eat, as if in a loop. His mouth froze in a grimace before he stopped and turned his attention toward me. Damn it, those horrible eyes. He was giving me the creeps, and then I started noticing further strange behavior. Something was definitely wrong. For one, we never saw him eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner. He would just say, I'm not that hungry, and continue with his day working in the basement. This went on for a while, until one night I caught him. Just after 2 a.m. when I woke up and I noticed he wasn't in bed, I crept downstairs to find the refrigerator door wide open. And there he was, standing in front of the open fridge, holding a plate of raw steak, just staring at it inches away from his face. I remember taking a step back and the floor creaking. He turned his head quickly to acknowledge me, staring at me before putting the steak back down and slamming the fridge door. Alex casually walked past me with a brief 
glare before going downstairs. That moment set us on the road of many red flags. And our livestock began disappearing mysteriously right around the time he came back. There were no traces of an attack, but it was as if something just plucked one out and left without a trace. It was the strangest thing, but... And the animals no longer seemed to like Alex either. He, he used to be their favorite. They would run up to him all the time for attention. Now they were spooked by his presence. The animals took notice of his change and kept their distance. During the day, he would mostly stay in the basement. Working, as Alex would say. He didn't allow anyone to go down there, and so we stayed put. I managed to take a look once or twice. It looked like a den where an animal was living. But once the sun dipped past the horizon, that's when he came to life. His movements were visibly different, more relaxed and natural. Sometimes I didn't hear him, thinking I was in the room alone, only to turn around and see him standing there, smiling. I felt like prey in a game. I didn't even know we were playing. I believe the trauma from his ordeal had left him with lasting side effects, so I was careful not to prod too much for fear of causing more harm. Uh, but I was frightened. I suggested for him to see a therapist to help deal with his experience. He just let the words pass right through. He didn't even acknowledge me, so I left it at that. And, and as until I saw him for what he truly is. The following evening, I was clearing the table when I happened to break a small cup in the kitchen. A mistake that sent glass flying everywhere. Alex made no movement at all. He was very much uninterested. Then I began clearing the mess when I accidentally cut my finger. A welt of blood quickly forming. I remember looking down and focusing to pull the shard out and when I looked back up, there was Alex staring down at me with a predatory look. Salivating, eyes dark and glazed over. I almost screamed. He asked me, Are you okay? Honey? It's such a weird tone that it made my skin crawl. His hand gripped mine tightly as he brought my finger closer to his nose, sniffing the air around the cut. I quickly pulled away and he seemed to snap out of his trance, now staring at the drops of blood smeared on his hands as he made his way back to the couch to sit down. God, it was disturbing, but I couldn't let the kids see any of it. Even they thought Alex was acting strange, but they didn't know what I've seen. I had already thought about leaving with the kids, but he seemed to be very observant of what we did. I, I didn't want to trigger him, so I did the next best thing and called Sheriff Crow. In our conversation, I mentioned an animal had been attacking our livestock and uh, that some had gone missing. I asked for him to come up and investigate, and that afternoon he did. Sheriff Crow arrived. It was still light out. The evening sun reflected off his silver sunglasses as he made his way up to the house. Everyone in the town knew him. Nice guy. I grew up with him. Always polite as a kid, very by the book kind of attitude. He grew into a dependable man with old-fashioned morals, well-liked by everyone. We both exchanged pleasantries for a few moments before walking the perimeter of the property where I 
pointed out the issues. Alex stood at the window in the living room watching us the entire time. Eventually the sheriff threw up his hand and waved and my husband slowly waved back. He must have felt something was off. Knowing that Alex was lost up in those mountains and the only one to survive. Then he started asking me odd questions like has your husband been walking around at night? Has he been acting different? Have his appetites changed? There's a lot of information to take in, but it seemed that on some level he understood what was going on. What did he know about my situation? I wanted to answer, but I couldn't, yet he knew what I wanted to say. He knew. Just right then and there, he told me to grab the kids and leave. So we did that. I trusted him. Sheriff Crow walked me back to the house, and we quietly stepped inside, making our way into the living room. I noticed the sheriff quickly unlock the clasp on his holster hand, hovering over the revolver. That frightened me. Something was going to happen. We looked over the window where Alex had been standing earlier, but he was no longer there. I quietly called out to the kids. Laura was in her room, reading while Dennis was fixated, playing computer games. They were annoyed that I forced them to stop and pack, but they could tell from the look on my face that I was being serious. The sun was setting, and when we finished getting our things ready, and Crow stood in the doorway as a lookout. When the coast was clear, we all hurried down the stairs. The kids kept asking what was going on, but I couldn't reply. I just kept repeating, hurry up, hurry up. The need to get out of there was overwhelming. We made it to the front door of the house when Alex appeared in the doorway. He seemed taller, more distorted. The atmosphere was dark and oppressive. And then he spoke. Where are you going, Isabel? His voice reverberated with an unnaturally deep resonance that seemed impossible. It was enough to get Sheriff Crow to pull his revolver and aim it directly at him. The sheriff kept shouting, Get behind me! As Alex laughed loudly. We walked back, trying to move toward the back exit, turning the kid's attention away from the core. I handed him the car keys, and that's when my husband rushed forward with terrible speed. Crow let off two shots. One clipped Alex's ribs, the other found its way directly into his chest. But he didn't flinch. It didn't even phase him. Crow removed a second revolver from its holster, kissed the barrel, and fired a shot into Alex's chest again. Alex stopped in his tracks and howled in pain. Whatever he had in those bullets did the trick. The sheriff pointed the weapon at the creature's chest again, but before he could finish him off, Alex quickly lunged forward and grabbed Crow by the hand. Shots fired into the air. With the gun still in his grip, he began to crush it slowly. A blood-curdling scream escaped Crow's throat, then he was tossed away. The gun sat on the floor in pieces while the bones in his hand protruded through the skin. My heart sank. Now I knew what the sheriff had feared. That was no longer my husband. I tried helping Crow up and he just kept screaming for me to go. He shouted over and over again. I fought back but he pushed me away and ran straight into Alex. back long enough to see Crow turn on the gas burners in the kitchen before Alex picked him up off the floor. 
The flowing blood from his ruined hand dripped freely into the open mouth of the creature. It let out a series of terrifying wails and moans before clamping down on the sheriff's hand and tearing it clean off. The man was in shock, pale white and gasping for air. He screamed and Alex turned to me, his eyes completely black and his pale skin showing a network of dark veins beneath the surface. The creature roared, hunched over its prey and eating its spoils. Then Crow raised his only hand and told it to go to hell before pulling the trigger. I ducked out of there just before the air ignited into a fireball that took over the house. Crow and Alex were both screaming. I cried while running to the car, fearing for my life, but I feared for Alex's as well. What had he become? Snow crunched loudly in my ears. I could see the kids waiting in the car up ahead. The creature's ungodly screams continued behind me while I fumbled with the door, constantly looking over my shoulder. The kids panicked, holding each other off and crying in the back seat. And finally, I found myself inside, then cranked the engine and sped off. While driving away from the house, I looked in the rearview mirror. On the roof, painted in the glow of the growing flames, was Alex, standing tall and watching us leave the property. His proportions were all wrong, and I could feel his stare burning a hole in my head. I didn't know where to go. We just kept driving. It was all we could do. We drove until we ran out of gas. There was no way that thing could keep up. Eventually we arrived at the motel we're staying in now. The adrenaline wore off and shock set in aggressively. It was a complete mess while distracting the kids with TV and food, but scared and miss their dad. They just keep asking about him. Luckily for them, they didn't see the, everything that happened. I can never tell them what I saw. They wouldn't understand. I called the sheriff's department and told them everything that had happened. That my husband attacked Crow, minus a few small details. When they arrived on scene, the fire had already been put out. They did find his cruiser, but not his body, or Alex, for that matter. They don't know where he is, but they said he couldn't last long out there in the elements. But they don't know Alex. We've been here three days now. A couple of older officers came here to take my statement and gather info. They quietly told me that this kind of thing has happened before. Now I'm curious to know what they're not telling me. I haven't seen Alex since, but I have been hearing strange tapping coming from outside the motel during the night. My son told me he hears someone calling his name. He says it was his dad. I'm afraid. Is there anything I can do? I can't stay here another night. We're leaving while it's light out. I know there are legends about this sort of thing, but how much of it is real? not going to leave us alone. Please, if you have any information that could help, I would be eternally grateful.
I started off my nursing career on the float team. That meant working on just about every hospital unit imaginable. Medicine, stroke, cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, emergency, orthopedic, rehab wards, oncology, not to mention a dozen or so other places. I got to be a jack of all trades and learned a lot. But once it came time to settle down, I knew where I wanted to end up. When the opening on the trauma unit, F6, the general hospital opened up, I knew I wanted it. First of all, it was full time, which meant benefits, pension. Also, I loved the staff who worked there. They were all just as nuts as me, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. I got the position and started working there, enjoying the perks of finally being in the same place every day, rather than constantly floating to different units. I got to know the patients and the staff members, their quirks and habits, which helped to make the day go smoother, for the most part. There was one patient, though, who none of us were ever happy to see that we were assigned to. Room 8. Florence DeWilder. She had a private room all to herself, despite the lack of adequate health insurance. Because otherwise, whoever she was paired up with in a semi-private would raise hell and complain to management. She was all sorts of trouble. The craziest part of it was that she was 102 years old. So you wouldn't think she would be capable of causing much of a stir. But she did. She was a spry old goat and she was having one of her good days. She would lay in bed for days on end, barely moving, not eating or drinking anything. It would look like she was dead as she breathed shallowly and never opened her eyes or spoke. But then she would catch us all by surprise with her sudden activity. One of those times, I remember, I was sitting at the desk at the nurse's station and she'd been out for days, not moving, not doing anything. It was 2 a.m. and I was half asleep and I saw her crawling rapidly down the hallway on her hands and knees, racing toward me like a old lady cat creature on a nocturnal hunt for floor mice. Scared the living hell out of me. Lately, though, she's been really awake. Like, way too awake. It's like she was hibernating for the last few years, and now she's suddenly woken up and wants the world to know it. Hence the private room. Otherwise she starts climbing into bed with the other patients or she'll start screaming because she forgets where she is and gets scared that there's somebody else in the room with her at 4 a.m. What a nightmare. For her and us, I suppose. The old gal is pretty mobile as well since she's been getting up and eating better lately. And although it's a good start towards getting her out of here and into convalescent care, it's been nothing but trouble for us. I know from experience that most hospital units have similar long-stay patients who come in for whatever reason and never leave. For her, it was a fractured hip after falling down some stairs. She miraculously recovered from that despite her age. Several months later... Despite the doctor's insistence that such a thing was impossible without surgery, which he refused to perform due to the risks involved. But now she's in no shape to go home. The waiting lists for nursing homes are a mile and a half long these days, so she's stuck with us in the trauma unit. And we're stuck with her. Because her family saw our dilemma, or maybe for other reasons that are less clear... They decided to get her a friend. This store-bought companion was called 
Marigold, the animatronic therapy doll. Apparently Florence loves babies. So they got her this ultra-realistic baby doll that blinks and talks, burps and shits, pees and vomits, oh joy. Now two patients to clean up after, we all joked. Oh, and her family is super weird, by the way. They said they spent tons of money on the thing and gave us a myriad of instructions to follow for the ridiculous thing. Don't get it wet, don't leave it alone, don't throw it in the garbage, blah de blah 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 I asked them where they got it to make conversation, and they got all super jumpy all of a sudden, and started acting even weirder than usual. As if I'd asked them where they got their black market human organs or something. They left the doll with Florence, and I haven't seen them since. I think I'm starting to understand why. I don't know where they got that damn doll from, but I know one thing for sure. It's creepy as hell. It's more than just that, though. She's really attached to it for one thing. She won't let anyone near it. She's really attached to it for one thing. She won't let anyone near it. Florence sits on her chair, the patient lounge with the thing, stroking her hair or brushing it with a comb. All day, every day. I went in recently and asked if she wanted to have lunch, since she hadn't eaten any breakfast. And she slowly turned her head and looked over her shoulder at me. The damn doll did the same thing, with its dead eyes lolling backwards in their plastic sockets, staring at me. The two of them blinked in unison. The doll's voice spoke as the old woman's mouth opened and closed in time with it. No, I'm not hungry. I'm just a little girl, so I don't eat much. I just want my bottle. <laughs> Terrified, I backed away from them as they watched me with their dead eyes and wide smiles. I couldn't control my horror at that moment, just screamed and ran out of the room. The whole thing was disquieting and disturbing, to say the least. I tried to tell the other nurses about it, and they told me I was being ridiculous. It was just a talking doll, and the old woman was playing a prank on me, pretending to be a bizarre and backwards ventriloquist dummy. After a while, I began to think they were right. But then I looked up Marigold online. The doll in question was made by a small toy manufacturer who created these lifelike baby replicas for sale to customers in Canada and the UK. But the ones on their website weren't animatronic. They didn't produce sounds or make voices. And they certainly didn't move as I had seen that doll move. I showed this to the other nurses, but they told me I was being obsessed. She just had a special custom version that could talk and move around, they said. There's more than one toy company out there after all. It began to feel as if people were talking about me behind my back. Like they were starting to think I was insane. But it felt to me like I was the only one seeing things clearly. The doll was possessed. That's why the family had dropped it off and run away, never to return. They knew what it was. It was evil. Two days later, the really bad shit started to happen. On another night shift, sometime around 3 a.m., I heard a gut-wrenching scream from down the hall. I got to my feet quickly and looked around the corner. I thought I saw movement in the darkness at the end of the hall, but wasn't sure. The shadows concealed a lot, including a corner where the manager's office was at the end. 
We always turned the lights down at night so the patients could sleep better. It didn't even occur to me in that moment to turn them back on to see what was lying in wait in the darkness. At the end of the hall. The screaming continued and I ran through the shadows into room 7 to investigate the noise. A man who had just had spinal decompression surgery was lying in bed. He had been ordered by the doctor not to move for the next 24 hours. It was a semi-private room and there was nobody in the other bed, so he was alone in there. I heard his continued screams and saw the blood pooling on the floor and the sheets covered in it. Despite my rising terror, I had no choice but to move in to investigate. The other nurses came in behind me and turned on the lights. They rushed past me. What are you doing? Help him! They didn't seem to understand why I was moving in slow motion, as if I was in a dream. I already knew what they were going to find when they pulled back the blood-soaked sheets. The man continued screaming and hollering as they pulled down the blankets to reveal the remains of his leg. There were mysterious, quarter-sized holes in it, where the flesh was missing completely. Tiny teeth marks at the edges of the holes. No one understood how such a thing could have happened. A few more days passed and it all started to feel like it had been a bad dream. I was on night shift when I went into an empty room on the other end of the unit to take my break to try to get a nap. I hadn't been sleeping properly ever since that thing had come into my life. It was evil. Spawned by the devil himself. I fell into a light and fitful sleep, lying in the stretcher on my break. I was in an unoccupied patient room, so there were curtains drawn across half of it, separating me from the window. I woke up to a sound on the other side of the curtains. Skittering movement like tiny footsteps running around on the linoleum floor. I bolted upright in the stretcher, my eyes darting around the room, suddenly terrified for my life. I screamed as I felt a sharp pain in my side. I saw something small, like a child, moving away from me in the shadows. Looking down beneath the blankets, I saw a piece of my left side was missing, crudely sliced off with something very sharp. I jumped up and ran out of there, slamming the door shut behind me. That was the last time I managed to sleep at all, even for a minute. As the days went by, the incidents happened more frequently. The pieces taken from patients becoming larger and larger. Flesh-eating diseases were blamed, although the wounds were like nothing that anyone had seen before. The patients were shipped off to the ICU to be isolated and investigated. Beds were filled with new patients, and despite all the insanity, nobody believed me. I began to stop voicing my concerns out loud since I was starting to get questioned by staff psychiatrists. They wanted to know if I really thought the doll belonging to the patient in room 8 was alive and eating people. I told him I thought no such thing. That was preposterous. I think I'm going to transfer away from the trauma unit. I'm starting to like the idea of being on the float team again more and more. I'm sure they'll take me back. They're always looking for people. But I'll request to avoid being assigned to this particular unit. The one with the 102 year old patient and her precocious little doll. 
no longer a baby, mind you. She's grown considerably. The once small infant now walks around on two legs like a child. A child experiencing a constant and steady growth spurt. Fueled by stolen flesh and pilfered blood. Her face and arms, hands and legs are all a patchwork quilt of puckering skin sewn crudely together beginning to rot and decay before our eyes. The smell is horrific. Marigold tromps around the unit with Florence holding her hand and everyone marvels at the amazing animatronic doll. What a fancy therapy doll, the visitors say. How would they go about getting one of those for their grandmother with Alzheimer's, they ask me. Marigold can speak for herself now, so I just let her answer. Her jagged teeth are plentiful and pointed. Her gums are black now and her eyes match dark as coal. She smiles at the question and answers to the delight to pass her by. You can't buy me, silly. I'm one of a kind. But I'll come visit you, if you like. Where do you live? We'll have a tea party together. They fall for it every time. If someone's hearing this, you have to help me. You gotta get me out of here. I'm inside, trapped in this headset with these haptic sensors all over my body. There's no way of getting them off. It feels like they put super glue on the insides of the gloves and the boots, or... I don't know. Maybe there's some more high-tech mechanism at play here, but... Either way, I'm a prisoner inside this VR rig. How did I get here? Well... I guess it all started when I woke up and... Notice something strange on my phone. There was a PayPal notification which read, Metaverse Inc. USD 3352. My brain was still a bit foggy from sleep, and I tried to remember what I could have charged my PayPal account for that amount. I only had a couple direct withdrawals set up to PayPal, most of them went to my credit card, my bank account. Racking my brain, I couldn't think of what would fit the bill. So I did what anyone else would do. I googled the unfamiliar company name, Metaverse, and looked to see what they did before filing a dispute claim. The name sounded familiar. I immediately understood why. If not for the fact that I was half asleep, I would have realized right away. It was the Facebook Metaverse. That 3D VR creation which had been created as a virtual utopia where people could go to shop, socialize, work, play, do whatever else the corporate overlords decided. But I had never signed up for the metaverse. In fact, I didn't even own a VR rig. This didn't sit right with me, especially since I'd heard recently that the metaverse was hemorrhaging cash and that the whole operation was failing miserably. The article I'd read spoke of 10 billion in losses, while there were only a minuscule number of users. There was no way I'd signed up for the service, and I didn't even use Facebook, so it didn't seem like there was any chance of an accidental purchase. My vivid imagination pictured a nefarious plan at Facebook to use my Pixel phone's Google Pay information to order the service without my knowledge. I requested a refund through PayPal saying I never received the service or product since there was no option for I didn't order this shit. Then I went to Twitter and began to make my aggravation known to the world. I have a couple thousand followers, nothing too outrageous. Most of my tweets get one or two likes, but when I told everyone about this, they totally lost their minds. 
people I'd never spoken to before started retweeting, liking, and commenting immediately. So this is how they're making back all their money? Using Google Pay data to subscribe to their shitty service no one wants? Said one reply. I hope you got a refund. That's a pretty sneaky way to get people paying for the metaverse. I heard they weren't doing well, but this is ridiculous. Another person commented. The tweet was getting far more traction than my usual ones, but then it was suddenly removed. I received no reason from Twitter, and when I tried to repost it again, nothing happened. Every time I hit send, it seemed like it went through, but when I went to go check the tweet, it had vanished again. Annoyed, I was about to post my experience on Instagram or Reddit when I received an email. From Metaverse Inc. Customer Service. Subject, Incidental Charge. I opened the email and was surprised to find it was from a customer service manager at Metaverse Inc. Reading the contents of the email, I started to feel a strange knot growing in my belly. I felt like someone was pouring cement down my gullet and it was hardening and drying in my gut, getting heavier and heavier by the second. Dear Mr. Group, the email read, We at Metaverse Inc. were displeased to hear that you had noticed the recent charge you incurred on our behalf. Rest assured that we are looking into the matter and will provide you with a prompt refund. As a token of apology, please allow us to offer you this additional gift. We noticed in your tweet that you said you didn't even own a VR rig. Well, we would like to remedy that situation. VR is a very fun and even therapeutic recreational experience. It is enjoyed by many people as is the metaverse despite your assertion that it is a wallet-fucking cartoon world built on lies for the enjoyment of idiots. As such, we would like to afford you the opportunity to experience it. The metaverse should be enjoyed by all. And one day, it will be. For you, we would like to provide a free HTC headset with haptic bodysuit for you to use. Of course, it will be your decision if you wish to participate in the metaverse, but we hope you'll give it a shot. Thank you ever so much for bringing this situation to our attention. Sincerely, the metaverse team. After reading the email again, I read it three more times. Were they serious? Was this a prank? A joke? Viral marketing? the hell was going on? I was suddenly very scared. It occurred to me that I had been, well, talking shit publicly about one of the world's largest and most powerful corporations. They could easily have me killed or silenced. They could probably wipe out my entire life if they wanted to. I had no doubt they could destroy my career in the tech industry could make my YouTube channel vanish into the world of shadow band trash. The doorbell rang and a chill ran up my spine. Was that them? Were they here? At my front door? No, that was ridiculous. Still, my legs were trembling when I got up and walked to the front door. I opened it and my heart skipped a beat. Jumping backwards, I yelped in fear as I saw a huge drone helicopter was hovering just outside. For a second, I thought it would charge forward, slicing my neck with its razor-sharp robot-controlled rotor blades. But instead, a screen lit up on the front of it showing a green, smiley face. Thank you for choosing the metaverse, it said in a robotic voice, then took off into the air, disappearing into the clouds. What the hell was that? I asked no one in particular, then looked down to see there was a large package on my doorstep. I picked it up and, with a growing feeling of anxiety, brought it inside. 
After a few minutes of deliberation, I decided to open it. This was clearly the gift promised by the Metaverse people, but I hadn't expected it to arrive so quickly. Normally, corporations were slow to respond, taking weeks to send things by mail. But this had arrived within a half hour of my tweet. Everything about this was disturbing and was giving me a dystopian sort of vibe that I didn't like. Still, I couldn't resist. I unboxed it and looked inside, finding a gleaming HTC VR rig with all the state-of-the-art haptic technology to go along with it. Sure, I'd never owned any of this stuff, but I'd researched it before. I was salivating at the opportunity to one day own a VR rig, but I'd never been able to afford one. Especially not one like this, which costs thousands of dollars. A handwritten card was inside the box as well, which I opened and read. Please enjoy, with our sincere apologies, the Metaverse team. It still didn't make sense to me how they could have done all this in such a short period of time, but then again, I'd heard that Google was always listening. Maybe this was just further proof. Despite my misgivings, I decided to set up the VR rig. I got it all hooked up and powered it on. There was an entire haptic bodysuit, I realized, to go along with the gloves and the boots. Trying on the outfit, I noticed that it fit perfectly, as if tailored to my specific dimensions. I put the gloves on, the footwear next. With all the haptics on, I took a deep, unsteady breath and put the VR goggles on my head, tightening the strap around my chin. A moment after I put it on, my entire field of vision became infused with imagery. After a few seconds of looking around, I understood where I was. I was in the metaverse. Surprisingly, it was pretty impressive. At least to someone who'd never really used VR before. Wow. I said to myself, glancing around. Yeah, wow, a woman's voice said, and I saw a cartoonish-looking lady coming around the corner. She had raven black hair and a scowl etched on her face. Do you have any idea how much effort it takes to create a place like this? She asked, approaching me quickly. And you go on Twitter and shit all over it. A second later, she was practically on top of me, and then she threw a punch hard at my gut. The impact to my midsection caught me completely off guard. It reminded me of being back in elementary school, when a bully beat the shit out of me during recess and knocked the wind out of me. This was just like that, except a hundred times worse. I was still recovering my breath on the ground, on my hands and knees, with no memory of how I got there, when she kicked me in the ribs. The blow was so powerful through the haptic bodysuit that it sent me flying, tumbling sideways in a barrel roll. My real-life body crashed into my entertainment unit, smashing into my television and shattering broken glass everywhere throughout my living room. I dug into my flesh and I felt blood filling the suit in places. Do you have any idea how hard we worked, only to have our efforts mocked? The next kick was to the back of my knee, and I heard it break with a bone-shattering pop. I screamed so loud that the neighbors must have heard me. Unless, of course, all of their Google Home devices malfunctioned at the same exact instant, playing a brief blast of loud music and drowning out my screams. That idea occurred to me after the woman left me half-conscious in a pool of my own blood, spitting out teeth and crying in pain. I hope you enjoy this place we made for ungrateful people like you, was the last thing the woman said as her avatar vanished. Because you're going to be spending a long, long time here. She was right. I tried to take off the VR goggles, but they were completely sealed onto my face. Same with the gloves, boots, and haptic bodysuit. I'm a prisoner inside this virtual reality getup while 
one after another, the Metaverse employees file in to kick the living shit out of me in every way possible, taking out their frustrations on me. I'm not sure how long it's been. I'm not even sure if this is getting out there. I eventually managed to escape from that section of the VR world and found this old school computer in an internet cafe in the metaverse. After trying every possible avenue on it, attempting to contact help from the outside world via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, I gave up and went on Reddit, hoping to kill some time. The subreddit popped up on my feed and I noticed it's filled with other experiences from people like me. People who had things happen that aren't normal. Maybe this post will just blend in. But maybe, just maybe, someone will notice it. Someone who can help. I'm not holding out hope for a rescue. At this point, I just really want to warn you all. If you notice a charge on your credit card, PayPal, or bank account, which says it's from Metaverse Inc., don't dispute it. And whatever you do, don't tweet about it or complain about it on Facebook or Instagram. Just quietly pay it. And every charge that follows. Because trust me, the alternative, it's much, much worse. My old neighbor upstairs was nice and quiet. He was an elderly Swedish gentleman who passed away not too long ago. He had a friendly little dog who sat out in the parking lot with him all the time while he rested on his walker enjoying the fresh air. The little pup would chase leaves around while he sat on his walker looking delighted. The new neighbors though, they are not so nice. And they are not so quiet. I woke up at 2 a.m. the other night to the sounds of footsteps running around above me loudly. Assuming the upstairs neighbor had a little kid or two, I tried not to let it annoy me. There was a jar of earplugs in the closet, so I put in a pair of those and tried to get back to sleep. <sighs> no such luck. By 5.30 a.m., I took the earplugs out and got up to start my day a few hours early. There was no point trying to sleep any longer. The noise of the neighbors upstairs was cutting right through the earplugs, like a herd of elephants was running around. I tried not to let it bother me, but the next night it happened again. Right around 2.30 a.m. this time, the noise of little feet started running around, stomping on the floor above me. The entire apartment was rattling with the noise. Half an hour passed, then an hour, the noise becoming more steady and persistent. It sounded like whoever lived up there had ten kids and they were running around causing havoc while their parents slept, somehow oblivious to the noise. Someone in, I'm assuming, the apartment above them, started banging on the floor with a broom or something like that, making a loud noise that scared them into being quiet for a little while, but it didn't take long for the racket to start back up again. To make matters worse, the noises were confusing as hell. At one point it sounded like someone had put two pairs of high heels on a dog and it was running around, going back and forth above me. Then it was like someone dumped out a bucket full of marbles and started rolling them all around the place for some reason. And the whole time it sounded like a bunch of kids running around with no supervision, stomping up and down in the hallways and running back and forth across the floor above me. <sighs> I wanted to yell and scream, but I'm too polite for that. Far too non-confrontational. So I just jammed the earplugs in further and tried with mounting futility to get back to sleep. Eventually I rolled out of bed again and went back into the bathroom to brush my teeth and start my day early, this time before the sun had even risen. 
The bags under my eyes were puffy and dark at work when I looked in the mirror, and people kept asking me if I was feeling okay. Eh, not really, I told them. I had some really terrible new neighbors who had moved in above me, and they were making my life miserable. Okay, so this is where things start to get really weird. I went to bed the night before last and got woken up again the same way. Noise up above me. Feet stomping, kids running around back and forth up and down the halls. But then I heard them running down the staircase outside of my apartment. And then they came to my apartment door. The noise of my doorknob rattling violently was jarring in the quiet morning hours. It was making me uneasy. Who would let their kids run around at 2.30 in the morning out in the hallway without giving them a scolding? And were they really trying to get into my apartment? I was glad I had remembered to lock the door. Every so often I forgot to do that. The front door stopped rattling after a while and the noise above me resumed. Kids running back and forth, stomping and clomping, screaming and laughing. I somehow managed to drift off to sleep again for a while during a brief lull in the noise. Sheer exhaustion taking over and allowing me to overcome the stress and annoyance of all the chaos, I f fell into a world of disturbingly vivid dreams. And when I woke up, it was to a noise that was not above me, but behind me. It sounded like someone was in the wall of my bedroom moving around, breathing, watching me, listening. I bolted out of bed and turned the light on. The noise came again, louder this time, like someone shifting their weight and scraping along the rough inside of the wall of my bedroom. The walls of my bedroom are in poor shape, badly needing repair, so I could actually see right through the gaps in the wood. I could see that there was someone crawling around in there. I saw a pair of little eyes looking at me, fingers poking out curiously. Giggling sounds could be heard from all around me. Terrified, I went to my bedside table to grab my phone. I was going to dial 911 when I heard something else, this time from the other side of the room. Another sound like a person climbing around inside the walls. But how is that even possible? The gap inside wasn't big enough even for a child, I would think. It was a very old building, but still, I was flabbergasted and frightened out of my wits. The phone was missing from the bedside table. There was someone with me in my apartment, I realized, just as I heard the sound of receding footsteps running off down my apartment hallway. The little shit had my phone. How many of them were there? I chased after him to the door and saw him running out, but didn't get a good look at him. At least I knew where he lived. Running up the stairs two and three at a time, I got up to the apartment above me, just as he was about to close the door behind him. I stuck my foot in the gap as he slammed it shut and it hurt my foot badly, but I didn't budge. Let me in there, you little shit. Give me back my phone. He let go, and I fell through the doorway into the apartment. I looked up from the floor and saw two, well, I wouldn't call them people, but let's just say humanoid-ish creatures, gaunt and tall with long, thin arms. They appeared alien almost. They had milky white eyes that were leaking white fluid which dribbled down their cheeks, and yet they looked at me with disgusted expressions on their faces. The one which looked vaguely feminine opened her mouth to speak, and I saw she had twice as many teeth as a person. Two rows of them. They were all tiny and rounded. It screamed at me, a serpent tongue dripping saliva, which fell from the corner of its mouth sloppily. The creepy little lizard children surrounded me. There were dozens of them, which accounted for all the noise. I screamed as they climbed on top of me, knocking me down. Their parents were leaning forward, ready to kill me, I assumed, when there was a knock at the door. Startled, the pair stood up and the children relaxed their grip on me, allowing me to spring to my feet. They opened 
the door, and to my surprise, my landlord was standing there. She blinked her eyes a couple of times at the scene in front of her. Oh, they were going to kill me, I blurted out. And that lizard kid stole my phone. He broke into our apartment, the woman, who was just an ordinary woman, said to my landlord. He's insane. He ran in here yelling and screaming about my kids in his walls and they stole his phone? Call the police, please! My landlord looked at me, angry and confused. You were always such a good tenant. I don't know what got into you. How could you scare those innocent kids like that? When I got down to my apartment after a few more futile attempts at persuasion, I was only mildly surprised to find my phone sitting on my bedside table where I left it the night before. I'm getting evicted now. I can't afford what they're charging for rent around here these days, so... I'm gonna have to move to another city nearby that's kind of known for not being the nicest, but that's okay. The neighbors at my new place can't possibly be as bad as those ones were. Right? Has anyone else received a strange email or a text message recently? Something telling you to click on a link. If you click on it, or if someone you know clicks on it, they're never the same afterwards. I'm guessing it's a bit like doing crystal meth or some drug where suddenly your brain is flooded with so many endorphins and feel-good hormones. That nothing ever feels okay again except for that sensation. And suddenly that's all you want all the time. I haven't watched the video yet, but my wife did, and now she's not herself anymore. I don't know how else to explain it. I came home from work early last week, and she was sitting on the couch staring at the television screen. I didn't really pay attention to what she was watching at the time. Hey, Christine, I said, setting my work bag down on the bench by the door. Usually she would pause what she was watching to get up and greet me. Or at least she would say hello, but this time she stayed silent. And I wondered if I had done something inadvertently to upset her. How was your day? I tried next, attempting to smile. She didn't say anything, though. Instead just... Continued to stare straight ahead, looking at the television with a dopey expression on her face. Okay. I sighed and went back to the back room where I had a laptop set up for writing. If she was going to give me the silent treatment, I could give it back to her double. I thought bitterly. I sat down and opened a document. Then began typing, pressing the keys louder and harder than necessary. After working on my project for a while, I went back to the living room, hoping to make peace. But Christine was still wrapped up in whatever show she was watching, completely ignoring me. Her earbuds were cordless, and so I assumed she had them in and was listening to the television using them, since there was no sound coming from the glowing screen. It faced away from me, and I refused to look at it, more a principle now than anything else. I waved my hand in front of her face, jokingly at first, and with more and more annoyance, thinking surely that would snap her out of it and she would talk to me, but she didn't. Ever since Christine had been diagnosed with her chronic illness, shortly after her mom passed away, she was looking for various routes of escape, ways to ignore the pain. It was never anything too bad at first, you know, a bit of weed and drinking at the start. And then she found other methods of distraction that completely took over her, lie, her life. Video games and TikTok, YouTube and podcasts. Those things became like another world to her, which she could slip away into and pretend like nothing else existed. When I tried to break her out of these periods of hyperfixation, she would stubbornly ignore me, similar to how she was acting now. 
Especially when she was feeling really down or if I'd upset her somehow. Why was she being like this again? I wondered to myself. Had I forgotten her birthday or our anniversary? I mentally checked the calendar and decided that wasn't it. Had I been neglecting my household chores? Had I forgotten to pick up dinner or done something else wrong? Thinking back over my recent actions, I couldn't think of anything. There was no reason for her to be acting this way. So I went to the kitchen, made myself a frozen pizza for dinner, telling her there was some left for her if she wanted it. So I took a plate to the back room with me. Her silence followed after me like a cold, lonely breeze. I watched YouTube videos and ate the frost burnt, overcooked pizza, which was black around the edges, feeling even more bitter than before. That night I went to bed upset. I tossed and turned for most of the night, getting little sleep. The bed usually felt much warmer, but that night I just couldn't get comfortable. The following day, I got up early to leave for the airport. I had a work trip and would be gone for a few days. Normally, Christine would drive me, but she was still sitting in front of the television, ignoring me. Have you been up all night watching TV? I asked, putting on my shoes. She didn't reply. Part of me wanted to sit down next to her and take a minute to try to communicate with her, but... My flight was leaving soon, and I needed to leave. I didn't have time for stupid arguments, especially when I wasn't the one at fault. Okay, I'm going. I'll see you in a few days. She didn't turn her head to look as I closed the door behind me and locked it, sealing her inside the apartment with the glowing screen in the darkness. My trip was extended by two days longer than expected, and I didn't get home until yesterday. When I opened the door and entered the living room, I was in for a shock. I dropped my bags to the floor, my breath escaping my lungs with a soft gasp. Christine? She had not moved. It had been almost a week, and she was in the exact same place as before. If she'd gotten up to eat or drink, there was no indication of it. I went over to her on the couch, my eyes running up and down the length of her, taking in the horrifying details. Her cheeks were sunken in, her eyes rimmed with dark circles like a raccoon. The t-shirt she was wearing was the same as the one she'd had on when she left. But now I could see her ribs showing through the white, sweat-stained fabric. Christine's mousy brown hair was matted and flattened at the back from being pressed against the cushions. Her lips were dry, cracked, and bleeding. And with her mouth hanging agape, I could see she had somehow lost the majority of her teeth, which were lying bloody on the floor by her feet. Christine? I said again, reaching to pull her earbuds out so she could hear me better. When I went forward to grab them, my hand brushed against her hair, and a clump of it fell out immediately. Then another large chunk of hair came loose and tore off after that. The screen was still glowing brightly behind me. Somehow it didn't even occur to me that there was something wrong with what she was watching. That something on the screen could be causing what was happening to her. I thought she was having a mental break of some kind. I scared for her well-being at this point. I did the one thing I hoped I would never have to do. I called 911 and told them to send an ambulance. When the paramedics arrived, I answered the front door of the apartment and let them in. She's just in here, I said, leaving them into the living room. Looks like she hasn't eaten since I left my trip a week ago. She needs to see a doctor. 
I froze in place, completely stunned when I saw Christine was now sitting upright on the couch, looking healthy. Despite the missing clump of hair on the right side of her head, the sunken cheekbones and cracked, bleeding lips, she hid all of those things with a smile and the glow of the television changed in an instant to cast her face in a luminous glow which made her look healthy and even beautiful again. She looks fine to me, the taller paramedic of the two said. He had blonde hair and a handsome face and walked over to inspect her more closely. Are you okay? He asked. Your boyfriend here called 911. Husband, I interjected. I'm her husband and she's not okay. She wasn't even responding before. I, I don't know what's going on, but she, she didn't look like this a few minutes ago. The other paramedic grabbed my arm a little roughly and led me outside of the apartment. Hey, what happened to her hair? He asked when we were outside. Looks like someone pulled it out. That was me, I said, and then immediately bit my tongue when I saw the expression change on his face. I mean, look, I just brushed my hand against it and suddenly a whole clump of her hair fell out. She's, she's lost a ton of weight since I left. Do you think... I don't know. Do you think she might have cancer? I'm more worried about you, the paramedic said. You look awful. Have you been drinking at all tonight? Doing any drugs? No. I practically screamed at him. Why would you ask me that? Sir... Most people don't call 911 when their wife isn't speaking to them. You're clearly very worked up right now. I'm just worried you're going to do something you'll regret later. You have somewhere else you can go, some place you can spend the night, a friend's house maybe? I don't feel comfortable leaving you two alone here. Given what you said, I won't get the police involved as long as you find somewhere else to go tonight. I'm getting worried this is more of a domestic argument than a medical issue. I argued with him a little while longer, but it was pointless. He wouldn't budge, only saying the police would be called if I didn't leave, hinting that my statement to him would be grounds to spend the night in jail, if not longer. Eventually I got in my car and left with just the clothes on my back, driving to a friend's house to spend the night. Luckily Dave didn't ask any questions and I was in no state to explain. As I tried to sleep that night on Dave's couch, I found it difficult to think of anything else but Christine back at the apartment. Still staring at that television screen, probably. More teeth falling out, more clumps of hair dropping from her head as her brain rotted inside her skull. The glow of the TV screen casting her face in green light, making her look like a zombie. Wait, that was it. The television. That was when I realized it was the thing on the television screen that was making her act so strangely. The odd glow it cast on her face to make her appear normal when the paramedics were there. Not to mention the fact that all of this had started that night when I came home to, from work to find her staring at the screen that was hooked up to her laptop. Whenever she was watching, it was changing her. And not for the better. If not for something I'd seen on here a while back, I might not have made the connection, but after putting two and two together, I, I knew it had to be so. My wife was the unwitting victim of a deadly viral video. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought I'd encounter it myself. A YouTube video that turns your mind into a husk, filling it with only one purpose. Spread the virus. I drove back to the apartment shortly after that realization. The sky was overcast and dark. There was a cold wind blowing that made me suspect we were going to receive rain soon. When I parked outside, I saw the ambulance was still by the door. 
in the same place where I had been when I left. Pulling the collar of my coat tighter around my neck, I left my car with a sinking feeling in my gut. A chill ran up my spine as I rode the elevator up to the third floor, getting off and approaching the apartment on wobbly legs. As I pushed open the door, a strong, coppery smell hit my nose immediately. My heart began to tick faster as I took a few shaky steps through the entry hall and into the living room. The two paramedics from the day before were sitting cross-legged in front of the television screen like children watching Saturday morning cartoons. Except for the fact that their eyes were bleeding. Their smiling, gap-toothed mouths shedding teeth which fell to the floor occasionally, making little clinking sounds. Their faces were bathed in glowing light from the television screen and they didn't even seem to notice me as I carefully entered the room avoiding looking at the television at all costs. Christine was lying on the couch with her head turned toward the screen. I wonder if she was too weak even to sit up now, and that's why she'd finally changed her position. Part of me wanted to step in front of the TV, blocking her view of it, or to turn it off entirely. But another part of me said that would be a very bad idea. She looked like she was doped up on heroin. I had seen YouTube clips of people receiving naloxone after ODing on opioids. The videos were mostly taken in the ER, and the people receiving the opioid reversal drug reacted violently when their high was taken away. Even though doctors and nurses were saving them, these people attacked the hospital staff around them, trying to kill them. I wondered if Christine and the two paramedics would react the same way if I turned off the television. Would they try to kill me? Or would they hold me down and make me watch? My eyes drifted over to the faces of the two paramedics. One of them had glasses, and the reflection showed the flickering images on the screen. And I made the mistake of focusing on those images for just a second. At least it felt like a second in my mind. When I came to my senses, I realized the light in the room had shifted. The shadows now cast in a different direction. It was sunny outside, no longer overcast, dark. I looked down to check the time and saw three of my teeth on the floor at my feet, looking up at me and smiling. The blood sprinkled on them made them look giddy and excited as they laughed. Want it some more, the chipped front tooth said. Don't stop. Don't ever stop. The molar beside it joined in. The real thing is so much better than a reflection. You've only seen a glimpse. Join them. Sit. Watch. Forever. I almost did, but then my wits returned again, thankfully. Whatever dose of the viral video I'd received was not enough to completely take over my mind instantly. But it was very close. There's no way to resist it. I can feel myself giving in. I can feel it taking over. I'll join them in a moment. Scared as I am of what will happen to me, of what I'll lose, I know I have no choice. I have just enough strength in me left to get this out there, to share this with all of you. It's important that you know. Don't watch the viral video.